behind your cross and that your will would be done this evening. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we're taking a little bit of a break again from the minor prophets, but we're still sticking with the Old Testament. We're going to look at one of the... uh, one of the people in the Old Testament that always gets a bad rap, you could say. Um, and if all we had was the Old Testament account, we'd think the guy was uh, pretty bad. So to look at this Old Testament character, or person, sorry, we're going to start in the New Testament. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Second Peter, chapter number 2. 2 Peter, chapter number 2. When Christ was on this earth and preaching, he was asked about the last days and things of that nature. And as we've gone through most, a lot of the, or all the minor prophets as we've been through, we've seen that most of them looked at the, the downfall of Israel and then Lord, the Lord lifting them back up at the, at the end times and the day of the Lord and all of that stuff. When Christ walked this earth, he taught that, he he was asked, you know, what's it going to be like in those end days? He mentions two men, two men who saw some of the worst of the worst this planet has to offer, and mentioned, and then, but didn't mention any of that negative stuff. When he mentioned, when he said how bad things were going to be at the end times, he said it'd be in the days of Noah. Noe, it says in the New Testament, and Lot. You know what he says about them? About those terrible days that Noah and Lot went through? They were buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage. He doesn't mention all the other stuff. It's always interesting to me reading that because it proves that, you know what? God knows all that sin that was going on. What he pointed out was, look, they were just living life and too busy for me and not giving me the place I deserve. I always had found that interesting. But we're going to look at Lot tonight. Like I said, Lot is a guy who, if you only had the account in Genesis, you would think this is a guy is just terrible. Because, yeah, God got him out of Sodom before the fire fell. Yeah, God saved his daughters and, well, his wife got out, but we know what happened there. But we also know what happened when the men, and we'll look at this tonight, when the men tried to get into the house to get the angels that came to visit him, he offered to send his daughters out instead. You know, reading that, you think, man, this guy's a scumbag. And that's, you know, the Old Testament, that's what we... That's what we have as a picture of Lot. But 2 Peter gives us a different look at who Lot was. And as we go through this, I I hope that you'll be able to see that, you know what? Set that aside what we know about Lot in the Old Testament. What we see about Lot here in the New Testament is a lot what we have to deal with every day here. So 2 Peter 2 Chapter 2, or 2 Peter 2, we're going to start in verse number 6. Chapter 2, verse 6 says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example, that's the plural of example, unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, For that righteous man dwelleth among them, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Those few verses say more about who Lot was than everything we read about him in the Old Testament. And we're going to read some of Genesis 19 tonight, but those four were mainly just three verses about, two verses about Lot, say more than all of that will, that you can find in Genesis. 
Verse 7 starts out and, and delivered just Lot. Now, that doesn't mean that it was only Lot that got out of Sodom and Gomorrah. It means he was just, a just man. Wouldn't think that reading the Genesis account, would you? Next it says, vexed with the filthy conversations of the wicked. Lot was just. God said it right there in his own word. But you wouldn't think that. It says he was vexed with the filthy conversations of the wicked. Now, we know about Sodom and Gomorrah. We know the things that were going on there. This account doesn't say that Lot participated in it. It doesn't say that he indulged in anything that was going on there. Just being there, though, had an effect on him. Just being around that, seeing that, living there had an effect on him. Verse 8 says, For that righteous man dwelling among them. God called Lot righteous. Called him just. Called him righteous. That's not who we typically think Lot is when we read Genesis. But God says otherwise. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, get this, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Three times in those couple of verses, we see that Lot was just, he was a righteous man, and he had a righteous soul. But just being around everything in Sodom and Gomorrah had an impact on him. It shaped him. It moved him. At one point in Lot's life, he had to believe something. He had to believe whatever truth it was that God revealed to him. Otherwise, we wouldn't read that he was just and a righteous soul. At some point, he trusted and had faith in God. Now, we never read that he lost that. But living day to day in that wicked world, it moved him. It changed who he was. It happened to us every day, right? I, I worked in a factory for a while. I work from home now, but I, I interact with people all day long with work. I can understand what happened a lot. We all can. You can't walk outside this building without being vexed with the wicked. I remember years ago, I was working for myself, and I did IT work for the Bauman Auto Group in Port Clinton. And there for a while, I was up there, it seemed like, every week. That's a 45-minute drive from my house. So I'd hit Route 2 and get up there as quick as possible. Just the billboards on Route 2 were enough to want to vex your righteous soul. The weather's getting warm outside. It's beautiful today, wasn't it? Man, God's good. He gives us, we had some cruddy weather over the weekend. He gives us a beautiful, glorious day today. But it's getting that time of year where I don't want to leave my house because I'm going to see stuff I shouldn't be seeing because of what people are wearing. Everything we do, grocery store, going to work, getting gas, it's around us all day, every day. It was around Lot all day, every day. Like I said, if if all we had was the Genesis account of who Lot was, we wouldn't think he was a very good person at all. We'd think he just got lucky. That Abraham begging God to not to forget about Lot. But in the New Testament, we can read that God wasn't going to forget about Lot because he was 
just. He was a righteous man, and he had a righteous soul. Being in this world, living day to day, just doing what we have to do can be a vexation on our soul. It can rub off on us. Christianity today is not what it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. You can go to most churches and see that. And I'm not talking just wearing a shirt and tie. I'm talking about just, you know, having modest clothes on when you go in the church house. Or the style of music. Or, I mean, there's a hundred other things. The Bible. How many versions of the Bible are out there? You can get a version of the Bible to pretty much say anything you want to agree with. You can go find one that's going to be worded enough that you can get, it, get one to fit your beliefs. Instead of you fitting God. That's where we've come today. We're living like Lot did. Now, I'm not saying we're going to have the problems we're going to read about that Lot had. But we're living in those days. In today's world, more Christians are going to say, what's wrong with doing that instead of that's wrong? Or why can't I say that instead of just saying I, you can't say that? We, we question things, we push things. Who changed? God didn't change. His word hasn't changed. We did. We were vexed with the filthy conversations of the wicked and are every single day. You can't turn on the TV without seeing it. You can't watch the news without seeing and hearing it. We have God's perfect word. We, have, we know the things we're supposed to do. But this world pushes and prods and drives us so much that we live in a nation that likes to tout that it's a Christian nation, but we have sodomites that our Christian nation have elected to represent us in Congress. Well, that doesn't make much sense. Who moved, God or us? We celebrate homosexual athletes. We celebrate musicians and you name it. Why? Because they entertain us? Who moved, God or us? So there's Lot in Sodom. He's not a Sodomite, but he also didn't cause them any concern. He's just kind of fitting in, going through the motions. He's not peculiar. He's not visible. He's not vocal. He's, he's not standing out. He's just living his life, basically. Here's a man that God called just and righteous, and he had a righteous soul. Living in, where, in Sodom, in Gomorrah, around all that stuff every day. And nobody knew that man was a Christian or a believer or, and, or had faith in God, or however you want to look at it. Nobody knew that. It's great to have a Christian on your job, but does it benefit the people that work there if they don't know you're a Christian? I struggled with this when I first went to work at Whirlpool. I didn't want to cross any lines because I kind of liked my job. I was very happy with my job. So I didn't want to rock the boat. Wasn't sure what I could get away with. Kind of like Lot, huh? He was living there. Remember, his flocks were there right outside of town. He was doing business in that, those towns. He didn't want to rock the boat, maybe. When I was working over there, I'd been there oh, four or five months. I got a call for a computer problem out on 
one of, out on the one powder coat line. I go out there, I met a man named Mr. Sam. To this day, don't know what his last name is. He introduced himself as Mr. Sam, and that's just what it was. Everybody in that area treated this guy really different. It took me about two minutes to figure out why. You didn't meet the man for two minutes that you didn't hear about the Lord. You know what? That's the kind of witness that Lot needed to be. That taught me that, you know what? I can still do my job every day so they can't complain that I'm not doing it, and people could still know I'm a Christian, and people can still hear about the Lord. Like I said, it's a great thing to be a Christian on your job, but it doesn't benefit anybody if you don't share that with others. So let's look at what would condemn Lot if we didn't have the Old or the New Testament. So let's go over to Genesis chapter number 19. And I know you're all familiar with this passage, but we'll take a look at it and uh, point a few things out. Like I said, without the, Old, or without the New Testament, if all we had is what we're going to read now, Lot's not a very good person. Let's face it, most of us aren't very good people. We just have the Lord's forgiveness. So Genesis 19, we'll start in verse number 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. These two angels show up to Sodom. They walk into town, and there's Lot. Lot bows himself. He's, he knows what they are. He knows who they are. And he's asking him, hey, come over to my house. I'll feed you. You can wash up. You can get up real early in the morning and get out of here. It's basically what he said, right? Rise up early and leave. Lot's a gracious host. He's respectful. And these two angels are like, no, we'd rather stay in the street tonight. That says something about Lot, doesn't it? I don't think it's reading between the lines too much to say they didn't want really to have anything to do with Lot. They were there to get him out. But that's about all they were wanting to do. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. He said, he's a good host, nice guy, very gracious. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, and the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, where are the men which came in unto, into thee this, this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. I'm not trying to be gross, but that doesn't mean they wanted to shake hands. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. So Lot's in his house. Men of the city come up. Hey, bring those guys out here. We want to get to know them. Lot slips out the door real quick, closes the door behind him. He's trying to keep these men safe. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let them, I pray you, bring them, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. A little side note. If that doesn't make your stomach turn, and maybe if you're a guy make you a little bit angry, the altar's right here. I suggest you talk to the Lord, because that disgusts me every time I read it. 
lost my place now. Okay, there we go. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Kind of funny, the wording of that. Here are these sodomites out there saying, look, this one fella came in to sojourn, and will he needs be a judge? You know what we get told as Christians when we point out sin? Don't judge me. Right? This book is current. It's relevant. Judge not. No. Read that in context sometime. You'll, you'll see what that really means, right? But being accused of judging someone, that's not new. Let's see. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. So the guy, you know, Lot's, they're crowding around him, crowding around him. Angels open up the door, grab Lot, jerk him in, close the door. This is where it gets good. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Okay, so here's this mad press of people trying to get at these men. They smite them blind. These guys are so depraved, they're, look at what it says, they wearied themselves to find the door. I don't know. I'm thinking if I'm mad, angry, and carrying on, and somebody smote me blind, I might want to go the other way. I don't think I'd keep doing what I was doing that got me blind. I would hope not anyway. That's saying something about these guys, isn't it? They're pushing. They're trying to get in that house. They get turned blind, and you know what? They're still trying to get in that house. Back up just a little bit here and point this out as well. Verse number seven, Lot says, and said, I pray you, brethren. These weren't Lot's relatives. No family of Lot at all, but he called them brethren. I always found that odd. I know who my brethren are. My brothers stick closer than a family, right? My brethren are here. My family's here. How far had Lot shifted that he saw these men as brethren? How far have we shifted that we might see things in this world as brethren or things that we shouldn't see that way? Doesn't take much. Doesn't take any time at all. We see things that nobody should ever see. You can ask my wife, when I was still running my own business, there was a string of about three months where every other day I think I got a phone call about a particular virus that was going around. And I had seen this virus, like I said, for like three months. I was ready to quit working on computers because of the images that the virus would put up on the computer screen. I'd be driving down the road and those disgusting images would flash in my mind because I had to see this garbage. I told my wife, I'm about done with this. I can't take this anymore. And thankfully, the Lord uh, saw fit to move that one on and another one came along that was a little, at least a little easier on the eyes. It doesn't take much of anything to shift us. Why? It's not that we're backslidden. It's not that we're not doing what we ought to do. We're around it every single day. It's a drain on us. We 
we come into church Sunday morning. If we come to Sunday school, we got Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. Three hours. Wednesday night, another hour. Four hours a week. If we make it to all the services. That is not enough to combat what this world's throwing at us. We need to study God's word. We need to be in prayer. We need to pray for those around us and those in our family, church family, blood family. But we need to be searching him out. Four hours a week is not enough to combat what we deal with every single day out there. I know it's not enough for me. This world is throwing garbage at us every single time we look around. The only way to get through it is God's word. God is so holy and he loves us so much that he, he's wanting to help us get through what we're dealing with every single day. But if you're anything like me, you're stubborn, bullheaded, uh, I did a pretty good job on that explanation, didn't I, babe? Stubborn, bullheaded. You can ask her, there's probably some more good ones, too. And I get in my mind that it doesn't bother me. I can deal with it. You know what? No, I can't. I can't deal with it on my own. I need God and his word because of what this world throws at us every day. Like I said, we're getting to that time of year where it's not safe for a guy to walk around except doing this or this because of how people are dressed. What's really sad is our churches today have moved to dressing immodestly isn't a bad thing anymore. I know there's a couple of churches in town. You walk in there on a Sunday morning, you're going to see things that you ought not see in a church house. I ask you again, so I've said this earlier a few different times, who moved, God or us? We have a lot of that that goes on in our world. Yet, we'll try to get through it on our own. We won't look to God to help guide us and direct us through it. Verse 12 goes on to say, And the men said unto Lot, Hast there any here besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because of the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place. For the Lord will destroy this city. Now get this. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-laws. You know what that's saying? He's saying, look, get up and run because God's going to destroy this place. And they're laughing like, they're thinking um, Lot's mocking him. Because you know what? Lot never told them about God. Lot never shared anything about who the Lord was. They didn't believe it because Lot never gave them what the Lord gave, had given him because the Lord gave him something at some point and Lot had to trust it at some point for the Lord to call him righteous and just. The people that live around you today, if you told them or invited them to church once, and that's it. Would they look at the way you live your life and the things you do and think you were joking? Or would they say there's something different about those people? They may not come to church, but they might believe the fact that you're a Christian. For me, where I live, I give out, if I give out a gospel tract, people think I'm weird anyway, so, you know, it's all good there. But what, what about those people around us? What are we really showing those people that we live near? Our, our, our families. Most of my family, mo almost all of my family, don't want anything to do with church or the, or the Lord. But they all know that I do. 
When I first got saved, I've been saved just a fuzz over 13 years. And you guys have heard me say it before. The, I, I had a battle with alcohol. The Lord just took it away. The day I got saved, that was it. But for years afterwards, we'd go over to my dad's for a cookout. Dad would offer me a beer. Then it was, he would, then he quit offering it to me, but he'd still drink around me. Then it became where he wouldn't get the alcohol out till after we left. Now, when dad has a cookout, he asks me to pray and bless the food. He doesn't have the alcohol out at all. My dad isn't going to say that I'm mocking when I invite him to church. And I do invite him to church, trust me. But what I showed my father, am I showing everybody in my life that same thing? I'm, I would say no. I worked in a factory with 3,600 people. You know what? I wasn't always the uh, bright and chipper computer technician on the plant floor. There were a lot of days I was grumpy, tired, and fed up. You know what? Those are the days I should have been showing them Christ instead of just the days that were good. The days that it was 110 degrees out in some areas of that plant, and I'm sweating because I've been out there for three hours, 15 feet in the air working on a network switch. You know what? Those are the days that I really could have proved my Christianity to those I worked with. And there were a lot of those days I failed to do so. And I hate saying this, but I'm sure I'm not the only one that has battled that. We have a great responsibility. Like I said, this world is terrible. Just walking out these doors is a vexation on our souls with what's thrown at us. We have something so great to share. Resurrection Sunday's coming up. It's a great time of year to get those in the church house. I've been bugging my family already. I'll keep bugging them. One year, we had some of my family show up. Praise God, my, I had my aunt here with her husband. Praise God, they go to a church now. I can't speak to their salvation, but you know what? I know where they're at Sunday morning and Sunday evening. I know they're hearing the gospel at that church. We can't give up. We can't let this world keep us down. We have something that will help us get through it. It's called the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. We have a direct connection to the Almighty God. We can get through it all. Let's look at a, just a couple verses to finish this up. 19, chapter 19, forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look at it. Look not back, or look not behind me, Neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest, lest thou be consumed. Let's drop down to verse number 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Lot was the man of his house. God called him, had a righteous soul, called him righteous, called him just. Lot should have been leading his family a lot better and to allow his wife to be entrapped in that city he lived in. But she was so entrapped with that city, she turned around and looked. We have a great responsibility to our families, men. Moms, grandpas, grandmas, it doesn't matter. We have a great responsibility to the young people. We have a bunch of young people back here that only get to hear about God maybe two hours out of a week. Sunday morning, well, three. Sunday morning for Sunday school, junior church, and Genesis kids on Wednesday night. Three hours a week, and they're going to a public school where they get taught all kinds of garbage. They are watching who knows what on TV, the internet, all of that. We have a responsibility. We can't let those young people down. We have to maintain the standard that God has set. Not what this nation or not what a, some church down the street says, but what God says is our standard of living we need to stick to. We need to be that peculiar people, those odd people, those different people. Those people where, you know what, when they see one of our ladies, A, they know it's a lady, and B, they're dressed modestly. 
when they see one of our young men, A, they can tell it's a young man. The young man's polite and respectful. My boys in trail life, I have it on my calendar. If I had, if I had my computer, I'd show you. Every fifth week, my boys in trail life get taught about holding the door open for their mom, carrying in groceries, taking out the garbage, helping fold laundry, do dishes. You know why? Because if they learn it then, it'll be a habit for them when, if the Lord sees they get married. If they learn how to treat their mother correctly, they'll know how to treat a wife correctly. We have that responsibility to those young people not to drop our standards, to stand where God would have us to stand. Like I said, walking out of these doors, it's terrible. I am so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm blessed and cursed. I'm blessed because I work from home and I'm not out in that world. But I'm also a little cursed because I'm not a social person and work was the one way I had to witness to people most of the time. So that's, I, I always figure that's God's little joke of giving me a job where I work from home because he prods me along and says, yep, you better hand out that track now. You better, you better witness a little bit now. But we have that responsibility. Lot had a testimony to those people in Sodom and Gomorrah, but he didn't share it. He could have been a great witness to those two communities, those two cities, and he didn't share it. The Bible says God sent fire and brimstone down from heaven, wiped out both cities, the plains, and everything that grew, turned it into a wasteland. Now, the Lord could come back any day. Tribulation times could start any day. We don't know. But we know what's going to happen during those times. That's why we got to stick to God's standard of things, not this world's standards. So I hope this was an encouragement tonight that, you know what? Don't get down when you feel this world bearing down on you. We saw what God had to say about Lot. He was a just man, a righteous man who had a righteous soul. But we know the whole story. Aren't you glad, though, that in the New Testament, all God saw of Lot was that he was vexed, still called him just, still called him righteous, and still said he had a righteous soul? Aren't you glad that that's what God saw at the end of it? I am because I know when I stand before him one day,